Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to JBC's weekly Authors at the Table series. I'm Naomi Firestone Teeter, JBC's Executive Director, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's discussion with Anna Solomon. A quick word about JBC before we begin. Jewish Book Council is a nonprofit organization that educates and enriches the community through Jewish literature. We have a variety of programs and resources that you can find on our website, including reviews, essays, author tours, and book club guides. I hope you will check it out. We're excited to continue to develop new ways to highlight authors and interact with readers, whether in the physical or virtual space. And we're so appreciative of you joining us here today to support new books. And we hope you will also join us tomorrow for our 7 p.m. Eastern time unpacking the book event featuring Esther, Sap Esther Saffron Four and Keith Gessen. You'll be able to find a link in the chat in a moment. Each week, a different member of JBC's team will be hosting our Authors at the Table conversation. And this week, I'm passing the baton to our digital content marketing associate, Simona Soretsky, who will officially kick us off. So passing it over to you, Simona. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's JBC Authors at the Table Zoom event. This is our second lunchtime author series, where we introduce our readers to an author and their recently released book. We hope each week you will join us and that you'll support our wonderful authors by purchasing their book. You can find the link to today's book in the chat. On the screen, you will see the JBC staff and we'll all be chiming in with questions during this conversation. Uh, if anyone in the audience has a question, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to share your questions for Anna. Also, on the top right of your screen, you'll have the option for gallery mode or speaker mode. So please feel free to choose whatever you like best for the discussion. With that being said, we're so excited to introduce Anna Solomon, who will be talking about her novel, The Book of V, which is out on May 5th from Henry Holt. Anna is the author of The Book of V, Leaving Lucy Pear and The Little Bride. She's written for numerous publications and is a two-time winner of the Pushcart Prize. Welcome, Anna. How are you and how are you doing during the quarantine situation? Managing okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really, really great to be here. We're so excited to have you here. Um, we've all been loving the book this week. Uh, would you be able to tell us a bit about yourself and also a bit about the Book of E for those who haven't read the book quite yet? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Book of E, here it is in its advanced reader copy form. Finished copies are, are here soon. Um, is my third novel. My first novel, The Little Bride, which many of you are familiar with in, at the JBC, um, is about a mail order bride to South Dakota in the 1880s. My second book, Leaving Lucy Pear, set in the 1920s in Cape Ann, Massachusetts, which is actually where I am writing out this pandemic. Um, it's where I'm from, where I grew up. Um, and so in this book, The Book of V, it continues sort of in the vein of historical fiction, but I also leap into a contemporary timeline. So the book follows three different women over three different time periods. Um, there's a contemporary mother of two in Brooklyn um, named Lily Rubenstein. There is a senator's wife in 1970s Washington, D.C. named Vivian Barr. Um, and then there is a teenaged Esther, as in Esther from the Book of Esther um, in 462 BCE in Susa. So the book weaves together these stories and eventually the, the women's stories converge um, and sort of collide in the present day. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us how you came up with the idea and what was your inspiration for telling the Book of E <laughs> in the way, sorry, telling the Book of Esther yeah. in the way that you do. Well, so I have always been sort of fascinated by, by Vashti um, since I was a little girl. Like, like what happened to this woman? And she, you know, she was always played sort of in this harlot-y way at, in the Purim spiel. And it was like, who is she and why is she banished? And it didn't quite match up. And so there was that question and it always kind of stayed with me and I was intrigued by it. And, um, and you know, and as I came into myself as a writer and, and, and a reader, sort of always been, I've always been drawn to texts that take sort of an absent character and make her or him present. Um, and so like Wide Sargasso Sea is a great example. That book, you know, that takes Jane Eyre, takes the mad woman from the attic and that book is her, her book. So that was part of it. But then of course I could have then just gone about like creating Vashti's story. I wasn't really interested in doing that. Um, I think for a variety of reasons, some of which I can't even figure out myself. 
Um, I think along with that was a feeling that I was having pretty strongly as a, as a woman who's, you know, now, you know, a mother of two myself and um, I work full time and I, I live in, you know, the 21st century. And it seems I was, I was raised, I should say, sorry, in the, at a moment kind of when I was born in the 1970s on the, on the kind of heels of the second wave women's movement with this idea that sort of everything had changed now and everybody was equal and that I, everybody now had equal rights and sort of this idea of liberation. And, um, and it turns out that my life, while very different, has also kind of feels in a lot of ways like my mother's and like my grandmother's. And, and a lot of women I know feel that way too. Like, wait a second, we were promised this, but, but here we are. Um, so I think that was a big kind of impulse for me in writing this book as well. And, and I did, so how exactly I came up with a sort of transposing my Vashti character into 1973 with this woman, Vivian Barr, who really does kind of play out Vashti's fate. Um, and then, and then I kind of create what that fate is, but you know, she also is banished from a party in much the same manner. Um, I can't exactly tell you how all three pieces came together, but those are, those were the seeds. Thank you. That's so interesting. I think that's, I mean, I love historical fiction and the way you can, you can play with that and yet bring it into today and see kind of how we still see these things uh, playing yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was really interested in how women's lives, you know, have and have not changed over time and, and watching that resonance and taking one story and watching it kind of reverberate um, and play out in different women's lives and watching them reckon with that story as well. And in that way, a big inspiration for the book was The Hours by Michael Cunningham and on a structural level, which probably a lot of you are familiar with, not a Jewish book, but, but also one that kind of takes one or one, one iconic book and, and lit, plays it out and reckons with it in the future, so. Definitely. Um, and would you uh, do a little reading from your book as well? We would I love will, to hear it. yes. Um, so I'll read just from the very opening for fun, um, and because it's short. Um, this is Lily, who I, you know, this is almost what I think of as the preface to the book. It's kind of laying the groundwork for the way in which I'm playing with another book. Um, and this is Lily, you, you can kind of see she's, she's reading basically, or she's speaking to her children here. And the, fir it's the first chapter, it's set in Brooklyn. It's called Esther for Children and Novices. Close the book now, close it. Look, the story is simple. Persia, once upon a time, king banishes queen. Queen refuses to come to his party and parade in front of his friends. Naked is what most people think he wanted. And he sends her away or has her killed. No one knows, she's gone. Vashti this is, her name's Vashti, you know this. And then the king gets sad and wants another wife, so he calls for all the maidens to come and win his affections. A maiden? A maiden is a girl, or a woman, a woman who isn't married, kind of, right. And the maidens come and put on lots of makeup and smelly oils, but when it's time for the beauty pageant, the king chooses the maiden who doesn't try too hard, the one with just a dab of lipstick or whatever they used, Esther. She also happens to be Jewish, though she doesn't mention that. She's very pretty, yes. No, she's not a princess. She's an orphan with an uncle who looks out for her. But then this uncle also winds up getting her into trouble because he refuses to bow down to the king's minister. The minister gets mad, really mad, and decides it's time to kill all the Jews. And then things kind of get kind of messy, but the details aren't that important, and most of them contradict each other anyway, which is why I'm tired of reading you this book and why we're going to put it away for a while. I know you like it, but I need a break. Okay. So the new queen winds up being really brave and going to the king without his permission, which is a big no-no. Remember what happened to the first queen when she did the opposite? And the new queen asks the king, and then it goes on and on and on like this. And she, and she says, I can see this isn't making sense. That's why we're done with this. All you need to know, and all anyone ever remembers anyway, is that the second queen, Esther, is the hero. Lily tosses the book out of the girl's bedroom into the hallway. It's a children's book, the biblical story dumbed down, but still it's convoluted, full of plot holes and inconsistencies. After they're asleep, she'll drop it in the recycling bin. Then later, admitting to herself that it won't be recycled, she'll shove it deep into the kitchen trash. Her husband may or may not be home by then. He is deputy director of programs for Rwanda at a major humanitarian aid organization. She is his second wife. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And we'll see who on the team wants to start us off. I have a question. Um, the research that you did for the Sousa part, for the Esther part, must have been fascinating. How did you do that research and what sources did you look at? 
Well, here's where I have to admit, I probably did, I mean, I did so much research for that part, but the research was much more based in um, Talmud and Midrash than it was in history, because when I went to look at like, so, you know, what was it like in Susa in 462 BCE? Who wrote the Book of Esther? Um, what was it like for Jews at this time? Nobody knows. And in fact, the, one of the really interesting things is that all of my questions led me back to the Book of Esther. Like, all the most of the information that you can find says, well, according to the book of Esther, and you realize that the book of Esther has been taken as the history. Um, and, it, and, and there's actually, the, there's a preface, there's a epigraph in the book, one from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in which she refers to the historian, which was how it was seen, you know, that this, that a historian had written this book. And the book sort of parades as that because it has a lot of this kind of farcical language of like, um, the official records say such and such and such and such. And so, so in some ways, what, what wound up happening, I did, I did an incredible amount of reading in a way that I've never done into the text and into all the, the you know, the, not all, but many of the writings that have been done about the text, the conversations. But I also took a lot of license with like what I actually created in terms of the palace and the camp outside. And like, I just kind of went with it. And that was really fun as a novelist. <laughs> I'm sure. Right. Um, sort of going off of that, I was also really curious, towards the end, um, your character Lily is actually sort of rewriting a um, Esther play. And there's, she encounters all these different interpretations of what might have actually happened. Like, was she actually her uncle's wife? Or, you know, or, or did this happen? Did that happen? And some of them you sort of seem to have incorporated into your retelling, but others, most of them are just sort of not. Did you consider those, um, how, how did, first of all, you come across these alternate sort of uh, tellings of it? And then how did you decide which to incorporate into your retelling? Yeah, um, I mean, I came across them through the research and, 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 and I was very grateful and I thank her in the book to my rabbi, um, in Brooklyn, Rabbi Rachel Timoner, who kind of took me into her office one day. I was like, I don't really know anything. And like, like remind me exactly what, what Tanakh stands for. You know, like that's where I come from in this. I'm not learned in that way. And she really helped me, kind of directed me toward how, how does one find readings and interpretations? And that was a place, the one you're noting, where I was sort of like, I, I, as a novelist, I think it's really important not to just sort of throw everything into your story because, you know, the story calls for it, then it becomes incoherent and it, it doesn't become, it's not true to itself. And so you, you learn as you write which parts are true, which parts um, belong in the story. And that spot you're talking about was sort of a dump, which I don't tend to do in my books, but it, it belonged there. It was like, well, here's Lily you know, like discovering all these things about this book that she's become really obsessed with and sort of sees herself in. And, and yeah, some of it's really wild. Like, oh, Haman's daughter, like, stands on a building and dumps feces on down on the parade and because she thinks it's Mordecai, but it's actually on her father's head. Like, how amazing is that? Like, did I want to write that into my book? No, it didn't really belong, but I couldn't really resist um, including some of that. I have a question. Um, what really set the tone for me for this book was um, Lily's fixation on Vera and how she kept comparing herself to this Vera character. And obviously, I mean, for me, it was an Esther versus Vashti kind of dichotomy. Um, and so for the rest of the book, I kind of kept comparing Esther versus Vashti, Esther versus Vashti. Um, but do you think that a woman is capable of being both Esther and Vashti at the same time? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes, I think that's sort of what the whole book is about, right? It's sort of like we, we come up with these dichotomies in our minds, especially, and women do it to ourselves, like who is good and who is bad and who is, you know, um, virtuous and who is not and who, you know, all of these, and then Esther and Vashti have always kind of fallen into those categories. And then you start to look at the story and you're like, well, wait a second, Vashti actually said no to walking naked in front of her husband. Like, why does she call it a whore? I don't get this. And you realize that the story you've been told about the story doesn't match up with the story itself, right? Um, and I think that in the same way, like these, these, these characters and these types, and we, we put them like Esther Vashti, Lily, Vera, um, Vivian Barr, my senator's wife, who also is the, you know, kind of pegged as the Vashti, um, 
they contain more, you know, we all contain, I think, many women inside us. Um, and the more that we, I mean, I think the book, my hope for the book is sort of to open up conversations about um, trying to bridge more connection and more um, women sort of opening to the idea that we ourselves and that the other women in our life contain multitudes, right? <laughs> that we can't just be kind of put into a box and then therefore separated from each other. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> And I have a question. Um, since the book is divided up into those three parts, um, was there a character or a part that you connected with more that you enjoyed writing more? And uh, if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Great question. Um, I think it would have to be Vivian Barr, probably. Um, I really found her character to be both very mystifying to me but then also like as I wrote her she became clearer and clearer and clearer and I almost feel like I got to be closer to her I mean I got very close to all of them but like that I really like if I were I, if I were in a room with her I really know what she would say I know what she would do um she was also a character not and I don't want to spoil things but like you know that I got to experience at different stages of her life and I found that to be incredibly gratifying and and really kind of thrilling to be like oh here's this woman that I wrote at that point in her life. And now she kind of just like more than I usually experience as a writer, she kind of appeared um, decades later to me. And I was like, oh, this is, this is who she is. I know this, I know her very clearly. It wasn't like working from scratch. Um, yeah. Cool. Excuse me for one second. probably um, this is um the nature of the pandemic work life i'm sorry <laughs> no but, um, this is probably a good time to remind everyone that if you have any questions you can put them in the q a or in the chat so feel free and, and, uh, and i well, have a question how did you get magic into your book where did that come from that was fascinating thank you yeah this is an interesting question i I don't, you know, I think the first moment that it, it really actually came pretty organically. There was this, I was writing the opening scenes in the camp in, in Susa, and there was this goblin that appeared. Um, I think there had been a goblin in one of the books that my kids had gotten over the last few years from the PJ library. And I was like really interested. I was just really into the goblin. And I was like, well, what if there's a goblin? And the goblin causes this trouble kind of inadvertently um, and then, and then what does that tell me about like this world that they're in? And, and I decided that they, that in this world, um, magic is very matter of fact, like not everybody has the magical powers by any means, most people don't, but that some people do and that that's the way it is. Um, I think that there were part of me, part of my instinct was to be very clear. And part of, I think my use of it was to say to my reader very clearly, I'm not writing a realist representation of what I think it was like in ancient Persia, just so you know. And I feel like that those signals made like were, were part of that urge. But then later, and I want not to give things away, I won't, but you know, later in terms of Esther and her own powers and the ways in which she is trying to kind of regain some of the magical powers that her mother had to protect herself. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of play with, um, I think at the core, the book is so much about power and is about the way in which women, different women find their own power and discover it and exert it in different moments and that it doesn't look the same. And I think that um, it was fairly organic. I, I, maybe I should have a better reason for this, but but she beca this became a big part of Esther's power. And, and as you know, from having read the book, it doesn't necessarily work out the way that she wants it to. <laughs> um, it's not, it doesn't wind up being sort of like, and therefore she, she gets what she wants. Um, but it's part of her, it's part of her attempt. Thank you. And we have uh, a few questions coming in from the audience. So um, Tracy asks, uh, what is your writing process? Do you write at a certain time every day for a certain amount of time? Uh, do you have a certain place you write? And what's your um, advice for our new authors in regards to process? It's great. Yeah, I'm, I've always been a very um, routinized writer as much as I can. Um, and right now things are kind of like, ah, but um, I, and I, depending on where I've lived, I've, I work in um, my 
I had an office in a house for a while, but then we moved back to New York City. So I work at a, I work in a shared writing space. Not right now, obviously, the Brooklyn writer space. Um, but I write, I do my writing, like my real sort of focused drafting, meaning like I'm writing new pages, new words in the morning. Um, and I typically, I try to work for maybe three hours is a really good writing day. Um, you know, when I'm on a retreat or at a residency or something, I can stretch that like stamina wise and then kind of take a break and then come back to it. But that's typically where my, how my writing works. And, and then if I have, I do other work, I teach, I do freelance writing. But if I do wind up with more time in the afternoon, I'll often use that time for research. I try not to do the research while I'm writing because it's always easier to go like Google something. So I'm pretty strict about like I keep the internet off. I protect myself. Like I have this app called Freedom that blocks me. Um, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty, dis well, I am very disciplined about it. Um, it's the only way to get it done. And I think that that is one thing I would say certainly is like you just put your butt in the seat and do it. Um, and I think also, you know, having faith, it's a really hard thing to do um, before you've sort of gotten feedback and felt recognized and had people appreciate your work, but having some amount of faith in the process and the fact that doing it is how you get better at it. Um, and also remembering to keep reading constantly because reading is how we learn to write, you know, like there's no, it's just, and, and you know, not, not in a, it's, that's what what writers do like we come up against a scene and we don't know how to write and we're thinking like well how and sometimes you're just like wow i've written three books now but i don't know how to move a person across a room how do you do that obviously i've done it before many times but like um so i go and i look at other you know oh right this is how i do it um so don't be afraid to you I and mean, don't plagiarize but don't be afraid to use books for the craft in them because that's how we all learn yeah definitely um another question from the audience from judy uh, she says, I love how you're bringing women's perspective to a story that's told by men, but I always wonder about the dangers of bringing contemporary sensibilities to a woman of a very different era. Could you address this? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I've been especially, I, I guess, I guess there are, there are dangers in it. I mean, I think that we sort of can only right from where we are to some degree. And I think it's important to sort of, like, I think the humility of that is important to recognize or, you know, like I can't pretend that I actually know what it would have been like to live at a different time. That said, I think that is part of why I, I mean, I think that that instinct and that feeling of that danger is part of why like I wasn't interested in doing a book fully set in ancient Persia and calling it a sort of realist novel in which I was trying to get at what that would have been. So the, the, the narrative voice of my book is very much one that sort of knows all, knows all and has this kind of wryness and ability to comment and is a very contemporary voice, I would say. And I think that that, so, so that's sort of my, I guess my answer to that in a way um, is just that it's, it's a very um, like, Sorry, there was a distraction on the screen there. Um, just that my, um, that it is a contemporary sensibility. And I think that like the book doesn't really apologize for that in a way. And I hope, I don't, I hope that it, it's obvious enough and sort of explicit enough that it's clear that I'm not attempting to say like, this is exactly what it, what this woman would have felt like in such and such a time or what her worldview would have been. Definitely. Um... I think we have time for one more staff question. Uh, I well, I have one more. Uh, oh, sorry, Miri, did you want to? Okay, pass? I was just gonna say, Anna, going forward, how would you talk about the Book of Esther with your kids, <laughs> having done all this research and reimagined it in all different ways? Great question. Um, yeah, and actually, I wrote a piece about this. I don't know if you saw it in. Um, in, that was in the Washington Post at the beginning of March. I can't even, no, April, I don't even know what month we're in. I think at the beginning <laughs> of April, um, about sort of coming to talk to my, like coming to talk about the story in a different way and recognizing, you know, instead of avoiding all their questions, like why, like about genocide and sexism and all of this, like starting to really engage with it. And so, yeah, I feel much more equipped now after four years spent writing a novel to, um, to talk with them about it. I, and I think mostly in just being as straightforward as possible and, and instead of brushing off the questions saying like, that's a really good question. And yes, this is really um, 
misogynistic and let's talk about what misogyny is and let's talk about like what the fact that the Jews wind up like the, the happy ending is that the Jews then kill all the Persians like no that doesn't sound great either you know like like let's just talk about it openly um yeah <laughs> and I guess um we'll do one last uh quick question but I was wondering if you having written this book um if you how you view the story of Purim now as well yeah, um, very differently. I mean, I think I didn't, for some reason, I know it's kind of a, you know, a carnival holiday and there's a lot of humor around it and all this, but I didn't quite get until I did the reading and research to understand it, like to what degree it was a holiday that was created or really, I mean, the book was created is the idea in order to have the holiday. So the book was like the excuse to have the holiday and that the holiday is really about release. And it's about like any carnival holiday, it's like, like turning upside down the order of things, you know, people's stature. So whoever is low becomes high, right? There are all these reversals that happen. Um, and that it's it's more about sort of, it's a, that I think of it now as a story for a people that needs to hear that story, as opposed to sort of a story that tells us exactly what happened at a given time, um, if that makes sense. And just to note, again, also just if people are interested in reading more, I also wrote a piece that was in Tablet about Vashti that gets into some of this more um, also in early April. It's all up on my website, but um, if people want to do more digging into this and, and yeah. Great. Thank you. It's all so fascinating. I'm very excited to read these articles. Um, thank you so much, Anna, for uh, chatting with us all today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Make sure you all buy her wonderful book. Um, and tune in next week. We'll be talking with Michael Zapata. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. This was a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Anna.